let's dive into it today. Uh, for those of you who may not know, we've been going through uh, this past year what is called uh, the story. And I just want to give one final plug for this. Um, we've been going through this. It's 31 chapters uh, that basically summarizes uh, the Bible from Old Testament to New Testament. And what I've been trying to do is each chapter uh, picking out a story, a theme, or a character, or even sometimes like today, uh, doing an overview of that chapter to kind of give us a better idea of the, the fuller scope of the Bible in its entirety. And so uh, we've made it through 31 messages. I also want to say that I've made it through. I'm really excited about it. When I said we're going to do this, I was nervous because usually, uh, you know, three or four weeks into a series, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to move on. Let's, let's do something else. Uh, I kind of jump around a lot. Um, but proud of myself, proud of you guys. Glad we made it through 31 chapters of the story. If you don't have one of these, I want to encourage you guys to pick one of these up. Uh, uh, in, in our spot, but also uh, you can get it many different places. Anyway, the story, that's the last time uh, we'll be talking about that for this year. But we have made it to the end, and I guess if there was a title of today's message, it would be the end. Um, when speaking of the end, speaking of the end of days, the end of time, however you want to describe it, many would say that dis destruction, gloom, and death, mystical creatures, bizarre scenes, and one world government uh, would seem to be the view that many people would have to summarize uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation is typically one of those books that people are either drawn to, like totally and completely, like hyper-focus on, or it's one of those books that people want nothing to do with. How many know what I'm talking about? Like people are either all in or they're all out. They're going to be like, okay, we're going to let the preachers and the scholars decide what's up with Revelation, we're going to go to some Psalms. Life is just much easier that way, you know. And so, like, you kind of have this back and forth pull of people that are all in or really all out. Um, we must remember that our belief, and we've been saying this all throughout this the story, is that our belief must be shaped by Scripture. Amen? Our belief as Christians must be shaped by Scripture. Scripture, uh, not Facebook theologians. There's a lot of them today. Um, not a series on Netflix. Uh, not even the Left Behind series that stormed the 90s. I know, shocker, right? We do not get all of our, our theology from the Left Behind series. Um, for today's topic, I want to be very clear with the task that I hope to complete. I want to complete one simple thing, okay? Because first and foremost, this will not, nor could it, it, it can't be, a summary of all things Revelation. Are you with me? I mean, that would literally take weeks, months, days, years, what have you. Um, there are several main views that are extensive when it comes to the book of Revelation, but I think they've narrowed it down to about four main views. Uh, we will not be diving into those today, and, and what I think I may do sometime in the future is spend some time in a series or something like that to kind of break this down a little bit deeper. Um, also, it is not my goal to make everyone see Revelation exactly the way I see it. But this is the goal today. I hope to give compelling truths and observations that will help you better understand the book of Revelation. Is that a deal? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time that we have together. I pray today that uh, you give us ears to hear and God, you would give us a heart to understand your word. May we be guided by the scripture guided by what you tell us, by who you are. Um, and so, God, today I pray that you would anoint your servant as he speaks your word. May he speak nothing more, nothing less, only what you would have him to speak today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, Revelation, we're going to start in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Revelation 1, verses 1 through 3. A great introduction to this book, and it kind of sets up everything, uh, I believe, about this book here in just really the first chapter. It says this, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is 
near. The time is near. And for many of you, maybe you have the image of that guy standing on the side of the street corner with the sign on the front of him that says, the end is near, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever seen it before? Uh, yeah, it's a good time. It's interesting. Um, I want to really cover three main questions today. First and foremost, I want to cover what is Revelation? What is Revelation? Also, I want to talk about what does it consist of? What does the book of Revelation consist of? So first, what is it? Second, what does it consist of? And third, which I believe is the most important thing that we're really longing for when we come to church is a bit of that application, and that is what does it tell us? What does the book of Revelation tell us as the church? So let's dive into the first question. What is Revelation? What is Revelation? Already I'm nervous because I have so much notes. I'm like, my goodness, okay, let's just settle into this and let's move forward. Revelation simply means this, the removal of the veil so that something can be seen. When you're looking at that term, revelation, it simply means the removal of the veil so that something can be seen, so that something can be understood and viewed properly. The revelation comes to John who testifies to everything that he sees and hears. So again, this is... John, the apostle, he is writing the book of Revelation, and he is simply doing this. He's testifying, writing down everything that he sees and he hears. Everything he sees and hears, he's, he's writing this down. Revelation 1, 9 and 10 says this. I, John, your brother and companion in, suffering, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, look at this, very important terminology. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Like a trumpet. I would also describe Rev Revelation as a prophecy and a testimony. Again, this is not terminology that I'm making up. It's, it's found within the context of Scripture. Revelation is a prophecy, and it's also a testimony. John is giving a testimony of what he sees and what he hears. So few would argue what Revelation is, okay? This is the simple question. What is Revelation? We're kind of giving you the outline. But regarding what it consists of and what it tells us, there are so many interpretations, so many interpretations on Revelation, and this is specifically why most people that are just reading the Bible, they, they kind of stay clear of it, um, or they kind of overindulge in it even at times because it's so mystical, and, and you know, we're kind of trying to figure out what does this book really tell us. So let's go into the more interesting question, and that is what does it consist of? What does this book consist of? What's in it? Let's focus on what's clear. This is what I want to do today, and I'm, and I'm hoping happens, is that we focus on what's clear. Because here's what happens a lot with Revelation. People focus on what is unclear, and it brings confusion. But if we can focus on what is clear, what does the Scripture tell us? We're, we're not trying to connect the dots here, 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 here. This is not the Da Vinci Code. Okay, we're, we're not trying to make up something out of nothing. What, let, let me follow the pattern in the stars and see what it tells us. No, God is, is setting a pattern for us in his word. And so it it's, shouldn't be confusing. It should be more clear. And so that's what I want to do today. I want to focus on what is clear in the word. Because when you focus on what is unclear, you get confused. I mean, I went to Bible college for several years. I had a class on eschatology. I've listened to scholars, teachers, all this on, on Revelation. And sometimes I'll get through with like a teaching or something and I'll be like, what just happened? You know what I'm talking about? Like, what's it, where, where's my brain? Anybody else ever feel like that? Like you're listening to scholars on Revelation? Anybody at all? Can I get, you guys understand it? Right? Like I'll come out and I'm like, it was great. I don't know anything that happened or what I know about the day or the night or the book of Revelation, but it was great. Right? On to the next study about it and talk about it. But the scripture is clear for us on what it consists of. Uh, Revelation 1.19 says, Write therefore what you have seen. Okay, this is, this is a, a vision that, that John is writing. He's something that he's seeing. It's also about what is now and what will take place later. This is scripture. Again, we're focusing on what's clear right before us. 
Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and also what will take place. So this is where you get a testimony and you get a prophecy. Revelation is a testimony and it's a prophecy. This book consists of the vision that was shown to John. What is now, the known things, and what is to come, the unknown things. Please understand this about this book. Revelation contains known things, but it also contains unknown things. It contains things of now, it contains history, but it also contains things of that will come in the future. Are you with me? So it's twofold. This is important because many act like uh, this book is purely futuristic. That, that it's just about the future, that it's just about the end, so to speak. But it also contains history. When you're reading some things in Revelation, they happened, okay? This is where a lot of people miss Revelation. It's like, oh, it's all in the future. I don't understand it. No, John is, is writing things that he knows about. He's also writing things he doesn't know, but he's writing things that he knows about, okay? Specifically when speaking of the seven churches. It's the first part of the book. Uh, they were actually churches that God was speaking to through John. All right, so when he's writing about all of these churches, uh, and also, just, just so you know, just, just hold all the questions till later. You can email us, contact us, northmen.church. We'll try to decipher through all of your thought process and theology because I know in messages like this, specifically those who are you know, about the end times, all of a sudden you're just like, oh my gosh, pre-trip, post-trip, mid-trip, trip it, It's confusing. Are you with me? It's, it's a bit confusing. And I don't think it should be that confusing. So these were actually churches that God was speaking to and it contains history, and it also contains end-time prophecy. If you remember, a few weeks ago, in the book of Acts, we talked about how Acts stated that we were in the last days. Also, common misunderstanding. We are not going into the last days. Please hear this. This is not me. This is Scripture. We are not going into the last days. The last days are not coming. We have been in the last days since the day of Pentecost. Okay, so... it. The whole, like, the end is near. No, the end has been near s since this book, since the church age, okay? Very important, because if we miss this, then we're always living life like we're waiting on the end. You know, the end is near. Oh, I don't know when it's going to happen. And every time something happens in the earth, we get shaken because we think this is it. There have been a lot of this is it moments since the dawn of the church. Are you with me? I was talking with someone the other day about this. I think we get kind of confused because America really isn't that old. Did you know this? It's a quick history lesson. We're only a few hundred years old, right? You guys do know this. Yes, yes. Let's look at this message as like kind of a conversation. Can we do that? We're just a few hundred years old, and there are, there are cultures that are thousands of years old, generation after generation after generation, right? And so the things that are a big deal to us People have been seeing happen for a long time. Are you with me? So, it's called the church age. We must continue with this truth as we view the book of Revelation. Because Revelation does not change with current events. Are you with me? Th this book, the Holy Word of God, it doesn't change according to a bomb that has been dropped... It does not change according to the persecution of people. It does not change according to any disease or famine that hits the earth. Are you with me? Revelation is the same. Okay? The book doesn't change based upon what's on the news. The news does not change what God's word says. And so we have to understand when we're viewing the world, we have to view it through scripture not view scripture through the world. Because when you view scripture through the world, I mean, we're talking crazy town. Or as Ozzy says, crazy train. Are you with me? I mean, you're, you're on the crazy train. When you, when you take culture and you start reading the Bible through what you saw on CNN or what you saw on Fox or what you saw on whatever the news station of your choice is, that you're like, oh my gosh, I think this is Revelation 13. It's like, well, let's calm down. 
You know, because we've been doing that a lot, and I think sometimes it can be a bit confusing, right? Culture doesn't set the tone for revelation. I, I feel like every time, you know, a bomb falls or something happens in Israel, you know, people start freaking out. Stuff has been going on for generations, and we're just kind of a little late to the party. You know, Americans, we're a little late to the party, right? It's like we're just kind of showing up, and we're kind of like, the end is near. And everybody's like, dude, the end been here for a long time. <laughs> Are you with me? There's been wars for a long time. There's been killing for a long time. There's been crazy atrocity for a long time. You're a little late to the party. So as we look at what this book consists of, it's also important to think about literary context. Please stay with me. I know this is, this, this is maybe a bit of a heady message. It's okay. We need these kind of things, okay? And we're going to get to the reason why later. We need these kind of things. Literary context is important. Just remember those two words. You'll feel smarter when you get out of here, right? Literary context. Let's talk about it. It's super important when I'm reading a book. It like, okay, let's break it down. It's important to know if a book I'm reading is fiction or nonfiction, right? Let me give you an example. A few years back, I watched this documentary <laughs> on uh, Discovery Channel. And it was about, I don't know what it was. Uh, Jake and I, Jake helped me find it this week. And he was like, you believe what? <laughs> so we like Googled it, looked it up. You can Google it later, be terrified, just like I was. Uh, it was about these little people that lived in the woods and uh, like, like, like eight monkey people. And they were like, I I'm being dead serious. It was a documentary and they pitched it like it was a real thing. I believed it. I'm, I'm serious, and I, and I spend a lot of time in the woods, and I'm like, I'm into this documentary. I'm being dead serious. I'm into this documentary, and these people were like documenting on these people, you know, somewhere in some other country, and like they're deep in the forest, and like it was, for the lack of better terms, it was kind of like that Blair Witch Project type of recording where like people had the cameras and they're recording as they go. It wasn't like a documentary like we're going to show you. It was like real deal footage. It was real. I saw it with my own eyes. Everything on the internet is true. That's a joke. So you know, it's sarcasm, sarcasm for the, for the literal folks. And I'm like watching these little eight people like destroy people and like drag people into the woods on like this video camera. I'm like, this is really happening. I'm never going to the woods again. True story. But is it? I, I came in here, I'm like, you would not believe what's happening in Brazil. <laughs> there are people in the jungle. I'm never going again. So anyway, that's true, and I thought it was true, and then all of a sudden, when I was doing more research on, online, I found out that it was just a farce. It was a fake thing, that they were trying to make it look like a real thing, and I'm like, well, dang, they got me. <laughs> like, I didn't go in the woods for three months, you know? I'm like, I'm not going out there anymore. No prayer time out there. Lord, I love you. <laughs> There's woods behind me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they, they live there, in there somewhere. You know, and, and the imagery was like, you know, the Bigfoot image that you see that's like Bigfoot's real and everybody freaks out. That was the kind of deal that it was. It's like you see this little person walking through the woods, like, with a knife. I'm still getting over it. But anyway, it wasn't real. That's what I'm trying to tell you. All that, that was, I've spent way too much time on that, on that nonsense. But um, it's important to know literary context because if, if I think something's real and it's not, it really makes a big difference in the story. Right, And so it, it, it's important that, to know that when we're reading something, what is this? What type of reading is this? What am I reading here? Is this a literal thing? Is this a figurative thing? So when looking at Revelation, it's important to determine what is literal and what is figurative. What is literal and what is figurative? Now, this is where we may split some, and that's okay. I'm not trying to get you to believe everything I believe about Revelation, but I'm trying to get you to think about it. Are you with me? Okay, so I've heard people say this throughout the years. Well, if it says it, it means it, about Revelation specifically. If it says it's locusts, if it says it's a beast with this many heads and horns, that's exactly what it's gonna be. As if God isn't capable of descriptive figurative language. I want to challenge you a little bit. If, you, if you've come from the thought process of the Bible is literal, it, there, there's no way the Bible is 100% literal. Let me explain that. The Bible is 100% true. Let's clarify that. 
It is not 100% literal. If it were, the Bible wouldn't say things like, God is a rock. God is a fortress. Jesus is a lion of the tribe of Judah. Is Jesus a lion? Is Aslan real now, you know, from, from Narnia? Are you, are you with me? All throughout the scripture, we have to understand there is literal con- or literary context. And some things are figurative, some things are literal. It's all true. It's all true. But at times, God will use descriptive language to do what? Give, give something some, some color. Are you with me? The book of Psalms is filled with it. The book of Psalms is filled with prophecy and, and poetry and songs. And, and God, through David, just uses beautiful language to, do what, to, to describe things, right? So God is capable of descriptive, figurative language. So I've never bought into um, the Bible being taken 100% literal. When you do this, again, it's absolutely wild. Um, it's absolutely wild to think that. And, and, I've, and I've heard that a lot throughout the years. Just out of curiosity, how many have, have heard that? The Bible is 100% when it comes to Revelation literal. I just want to know. I'm not going to stone you. Okay, cool. That's great. And if, if you believe that, work through it. I'm, I'm here to challenge you and dig into that a little bit today. Because the way we view Revelation really matters. It matters. We'll talk about more of that later. Um, so we have to understand there was an actual audience as well. There were actual readers. It says in uh, chapter 1, verse 4, to the, church, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Asia. Okay? Th- this letter was to people. It was written to somebody. It wasn't just like, like John ate some mushrooms and he's tripping out and he's like writing stuff. Okay, this is what people think sometimes when it comes to Revelation. Well, I'm, just writing, I'm just writing stuff in the spirit, you know. No, he, he was of sound mind. He knew what he was writing. He knew who, who he was writing to. So the reader, and again, this is huge. The reader would have understood the terminology. The reader would have understood the imagery. Specifically, much better than us, uh, the Old Testament references that are all throughout Revelation. So many Old Testament references throughout the book of Revelation. And the reason why is because they were Jewish. And so when, when there's certain things we see in the New Testament, it's like, we don't get it because it's not our culture. Right? And then so we read some far out book or whatever, and we're like, oh man, it's going to be crazy, wild, and you know, just terrible, terrifying, all this stuff. It's like, well, maybe, maybe we just don't know the imagery they're talking about. Maybe we just haven't understood the Old Testament references that's in the book of Revelation. So there are so many Old Testament callbacks that reference Old Testament. And so a Jewish audience would totally understand these things much more than us. How we really mess up and misinterpret Revelation is by reading it through our personal lens. I've already talked about this, but I want to talk about it more because it's so important. We do this with Scripture all the time. You know, it's like I've tried to tell people before that, you know, when it says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, that doesn't mean that you can be the best football player ever. It doesn't mean you're going to win every game. Are you with me? You know, there, there's a context to that scripture. It, Paul's saying, look, I've dealt with a lot of stuff, and whether I win or lose, I know that I can do all things. Are you with me? You understand that? Like, he, there's a point and a purpose to why he's saying something. And so specifically with Revelation, we cannot read it through this American uh, current events lens. We can't do it. We're going to miss it. People, people have been making the book of Revelation look foolish for a while by saying the world's going to end on this date and this date. How many have ever heard of the world ending before? Dang, we're still here. And it's, it's not that I'm, I'm kind of poking fun, I guess, a little bit, but I'm saying it happens over and over and over again, and that's the kind of stuff that's got to stop. We, we got to stop that stuff. I know, hopefully you're not doing that. I'm saying the church in general, like, we have to stop predicting when this is going to happen. No man knows the day or the hour, okay? But w- what we do know is clear, and so this is always confusing to me about the church, is the church wants to focus on all this stuff that's not clear while we have a whole kind of, like, a whole bunch of clarity right in front of us. So let's focus on that. We can't read the Bible through our lens. 
We're going to miss the point, the purpose, and I'm going to say the beauty of this book. We miss, we miss the beauty of this book because the church is too terrified to read the book because the church thinks the book's about something it's not about. I mean, it is about the end, but we get this idea about what the end looks like. This, this, this book should be beautiful for the church. Let me, let me give you an example. Again, this is in chapter 1. Uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, John. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who, I'm sorry. You know what I'm trying to say. Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Look at this. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. That sounds pretty encouraging to me. This sounds like a book that is supposed to encourage the people of God. Not a book that's supposed to terrify the people of God or make the people of God fight and, and get all up in arms. No, this is a book that is supposed to bless God's people. I love what Nathan said a few weeks ago when he talked about prophecy, about stirring up, building up, cheering up. Man, that's so good. And, and this is a prophecy that should stir us up, it should build us up, it should cheer us up. Current events do not drive or change Scripture. Scripture is the source. Hey, can you hit me with one of those? I know you're getting it for someone else. Can I have that? I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You can get another one. You were on your way. You can get another one. Okay. That's awesome. I needed that. It's that time of year, okay, guys? It just is. So, the end of the world has been predicted countless times based upon current events. It's safe to say that it's not safe to do this. Okay, it's safe to say it's not safe to do this. I, I don't think that it builds up and edifies the church at all to have another date thrown out about when this is gonna go down. All right, and why does this matter? This is an important question. Oh, I got so much to cover. We're getting there. Why does this matter? Because I've had people ask me this before. Well, this doesn't matter to me. You know, Holly and I talk a lot about these things and she's like, you know, it just doesn't really matter to me that much. And I get that. I, appreci I appreciate that take. But here, here is why it does matter. It matters because a proper view on this book will shape a lot of our beliefs about who God is and who the church is. The way you view Revelation, yes. It'll shape the way you view God, and it'll shape the way you view the church. I've encountered a great deal of people who are really into end times that are fearful and they're flighty in their views. I, listen to me, I, I am not afraid I'm not afraid of the end, so to speak. You shouldn't be afraid of the end. You should not buy into this fear-driven culture that makes everything crazy scary. The, ch the church has nothing to be scared of. Are you with me? We're, we're, you can clap for that. It, we're, we're in the church age, and the church will remain. So we have nothing to be afraid of. There is a big question that I think is important for all of us to answer specifically when it comes to this topic. All right, this is a this is massive question we need to ask ourselves and even ask others at times when they, they are very, uh, maybe even dogmatic about their approach to certain things. How did you get to that conclusion? Because I'm telling you, if I, if, if, if I get questions and comments about end times, and because pe people have some very serious views about end times, I will ask this one question. How did you get to that conclusion? Because I know how I get to a conclusion, and that's through his word. Now, does that mean that I'm always right? Absolutely not. I'm a, I'm a finite being. I'm understanding. I'm learning. I'm reading. I'm growing. And let me just go ahead and tell you, right now, throughout the years, my, my mind and my heart has changed drastically on the book of Revelation. So we have to give each other grace for that. Are you with me? But when we hear people that are very dogmatic about what they believe, how did you get to that conclusion? And, and, and I'm not being disrespectful when I say this. Hear it. And don't tell me that you jumped from Revelation to Daniel to Ezekiel to Hosea 
to John, to this, and to this, and to this. Don't, don't connect the dots that way for me. Are you with me? We can make the Bible say anything we want the Bible to say. We're seeing culture do that like crazy now. Let's be sure that the church doesn't do that with its own people. Are you with me? Now, it's okay to cross-reference. It's okay to go through. I'm, please, messages like this can go so south so quick. Right, because like, oh, wow, I shouldn't listen to anybody I've ever listened to. No, I'm just saying weigh it. Weigh what you hear. What, the things I'm saying today, weigh it. Weigh it according to God's word, okay? But we have to be clear on how we get to a conclusion. And please, for the love of all things good, don't base your theology that you, on the fact that you watched the Left Behind series a few years back. Don't do that. Don't, don't let that be the basis of what you believe. Are you with me? Because if it is, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to present something in a way that it is not the way that it is, okay? So we need to understand when we get to a conclusion, it has to come through the word of God. People will say, well, I, I, I believe this. The question is, how do you get to that conclusion? How do you get to that conclusion? Number three, this is the most important thing. Should have, should have maybe started with this to soften that a little bit. How, how, do we, how do we pull out of Revelation what is for the church? So the question is, what does it tell us? What does it tell us? What, is, what does Revelation tell us? Well, it, it's gonna tell us, I believe, four things specifically. I'm gonna kind of move through this, but I believe this is the most important part of the talk. Jesus is building his church. What, what does Revelation tell us? It tells us that Jesus is building his church. I love that song we sang this morning, the, our firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Man, when at, listen to the, the, to the words, they're beautiful. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad. When news and media has lost their mind, I, it, it's all good, you know why? Because Jesus is building his church. He's building his church, and this message was to stir up the church, to say, hey, Jesus is building his church. He's building his church through guidance, through correction. You can see that through the seven churches. The church is God's plan for the world. It is the most important thing that we can be a part of. It, I'm telling you, it is the most important thing that we can give to our families because the church is what lasts Jesus is building his church. People are like, well, what if my kids don't want to go? You, you think my kids always want to go to everything we're doing? Absolutely not. But at the end of their life, they will realize, hey, we, we were building our life upon a firm foundation. Jesus is building his church. The second thing that the book of Revelation tells us is that Jesus is coming for his church. Jesus is coming for his church. Now, again, on this point, there are a lot of different views, but here's what's clear. Are you guys with me? This is what's clear. No, we're not gonna get into pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, all, uh, all that confusing stuff, all right? This is clear. Through the book of Revelation, Jesus is coming for his church. Here's what else I know about how Jesus is coming. He's coming once, and it's gonna be obvious. That's not me, that's scripture. He's coming once and it's gonna be obvious. The, and, and, and here's another thing, the church is not split into segments. The church is not, Paul even writes about it. We're not, we're not Jew, Gentile, slave, free, barbarian, are you with me? He said we're, we are one in Christ. He's coming for his people. He's coming for his bride. Jesus is coming for his church. All those who have confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior and living for him, Jesus is coming. So, so why? Why do we get so caught up on all, all the confusing stuff? Can we just be encouraged for a moment and say Jesus is coming for his church? Like, that's good stuff. He's building it and he's coming for us. We are all his people who have called on his name. Here's what else we learn from Revelation. Jesus will make all things new. Jesus will make all things new. It talks about a new heaven, it talks about a new earth. Jesus is gonna make some stuff new. Are you with me? 
new heavens, new earth. His kingdom come. I, I, love, I love this prayer so much that Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When his kingdom comes, it makes things new. And so that's why I believe the church should be different. When people walk in the church, it's, it's the most unique place, I believe, on the planet. It is because all of us together are a part of the kingdom. So when people come into this place, they should feel and experience kingdom. They should feel and experience kingdom. That's why people say, well, man, I, man, I just felt something today in church. Man, that just spoke to me. I was encouraged. People were smiling. They were you know, shaking my hand. Like It should be a kingdom place. Jesus is ultimately going to make all things new on heaven and on earth. That's what the scripture tells us. So I love when Jesus says, his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the last thing that Revelation tells us, for today's message anyway, is that the church remains. The church remains. What, what always remains throughout time and history? God's people. Are you with me? When the Israelites were crossing the Red Sea, who was swept away? Not God's people. God's people remains. Are you with me? When they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire, who remain? God's people. When they threw Daniel in the lion's den, who remain? God's people. In the, in the New Testament, when they tried to persecute the church and destroy the church, who remain? Are you with me? When they try to burn Bibles and they try to eradicate, eradicate Christianity from the earth, what remains? The church remains. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Cole, you can go ahead and come on up. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. All unrighteousness will fade, but only righteousness will remain. Are you with me? So let's recap those points real quick. What does Revelation tell us? Jesus is building his church. Jesus is coming for his church. Jesus will make all things new, and the church remains. Let's stand to our feet this morning. It's important that we know and understand why we believe what we believe because it gives us a proper understanding and view of who God is and who the church is and also of who we are. And so I don't know if you've looked at Revelation in a way before where you're, you're always fearful and, and, and flighting your beliefs and your understanding. Man, let's, just, let's remember what we've heard today. I haven't figured it all out. It's a, it's a daunting task. It's a daunting book. Um, but I think the book's a lot more clear than what we might make it. And I wanna just give you guys a challenge. Just, I want you to read, read it sometime. Just read it. Just, and, and don't read it through the lens of news and media. Don't read it through the lens of, of, of COVID or, or anything that's happened the past couple of years or bombs dropping somewhere in Russia and Ukraine. Don't, don't read it with that lens. Read it. Read it. Say, God, help me to read this book and hear what you're saying to your church through this book. And I think the more that we do that, the more we begin to understand that the book is, is not as confusing as we might, what we might think, but it's very clear on a lot of things. That Jesus is building his church. He's coming for his church. He's making all things new and the church remains. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. Thank you for your word. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would, would lead God and direct us. Lord, this is a journey and may we understand that. that as, as we're walking this road of faith, we, we become made new. We change. Our minds, our hearts are expanded as we know the scripture and understand it more. And so I pray that that would take place in this house, but also outside of this house. Maybe some of us have never given revelation a thought. You may think, why does it matter? Well, God, I pray that when it comes to the end, when it comes to the end of days, the last days, that our heart and our desire ultimately would just be that we want to be in the kingdom, a part of the kingdom, and showing the kingdom to others. I pray that you would have your will and have your way in this house today. If there be someone here today that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, man, I want you to know that he loves you so much. He wants you to be a part of the church. 
He wants you to remain. He wants to come for you. He died on a cross and he rose again from a grave on the third day so that you could be set free. And you say, well, how is that possible? By simply trusting in him and what he has done for us. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. If you're here today, you don't know him, simply say, Jesus, I need you. I wanna know you more. Change me, make me new. I wanna follow after you. God, thank you for your church. I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead God, direct us. I pray, God, we've learned and understood more today, uh, that we've been helped to read the word of God and to apply it to our life. We give you all praise. We give you all honor. We give you all glory today. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.